I'd like to call the hearing to order and welcome uh, our guests and, and my colleagues. Um, we're going to, uh, I recommend myself for five minutes uh, uh, for an opening statement. Before I do that, those early votes, as a lot of members know, we're going to try to go rapidly through the opening statements as quick as possible and then get into our round of questioning. Um, we will then break for votes. We'll see what the will of the committees are. I may have to come back to finish up at least the first round. But um, with that, I'd like to now recognize myself for uh, five minutes for my opening statement. First, let me welcome you all here. It is nearly two years since the Fukushima accident and nearly one year since the NRC issued a suite of requirements responding to the accident. Since you last testified before this committee, the NRC instituted a moratorium on licensing actions until the agency addressed a court remand of its waste confidence rule. We have also heard announcements two nuclear plants will close prematurely, and there is speculation in the press that several others may also. So it is in this context I'd like to discuss the defense in depth philosophy, which has been fundamental to nuclear safety in our country since the industry's inception. I'm sure we all agree it plays a vital safety role. That was a painful lesson for the Japanese to learn, and one that was highlighted by the Diet Report, which stated, the defense and death concept used in other countries has still not been fully considered. With the Atomic Energy Act, Congress endeavored to balance the benefits that nuclear energy brings to the general welfare with protection of public health and safety. I'm concerned the Commission risks undermining this balance by shifting to an unlimited application of the defense and death philosophy in reaction to the Fukushima incident. Defense and death has or should have a sensible constraint. For example, I understand there is a three-unit nuclear plant here in the United States which currently has eight emergency diesel generators. These reactors need six generators to ensure safety in case the plant loses access to off-site supplies of electricity. That means this site has two redundant spares. In the wake of Fukushima, this site would add two more in a separate bunker away from the plant for a total of ten diesel generators. An unmanaged application of the defense and death philosophy would question, why stop at 10? Why not have 20 or 100? I don't know what the right number is. However, common sense and critical thinking should show that at some point there are diminishing safety benefits from additional generators. It seems to me cost-benefit analysis provides a necessary and sensible constraint in this situation, that safety gains should be significant enough to outweigh additional costs. Unfortunately, with the NRC staff's filtered vents proposal, we have exactly the opposite. The staff's recommendation to mandate filtered vent structures failed the cost-benefit test so that the staff chose to justify the mandate based upon the defense and death philosophy. The staff recommended this mandate against the advice of the NRC's body of experts, the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards. That committee advised a more holistic approach, recognizing that all plants are different and a one-size-fits-all mandate may create unintended consequences. As a near-term task force wrote in their 2011 report following the Fukushima accident, and I quote, adequate protection has typically only led to requirements addressing beyond design basis concerns when they were found to be associated with a substantial enhancement in safety and justified in terms of cost. Recommendation one in their report was that the Commission should reassess the role that the defense in death philosophy should play. While the Commission has not resolved this policy question, agency staff nonetheless appears to be embedding its preferred approach in the filtered vent recommendation. I don't think the staff should attempt to set policy on a matter on which the Commission has not yet reached a conclusion. Furthermore, this matter was raised in our January 15th letter, which 20 of my colleagues and I signed and the Commission's response was unsatisfactory, beginning with the failure to answer our very first question. When will the NRC conduct a gap analysis of the regulation differences between the U.S. and Japan? I expect some of my colleagues will likely share some additional concerns with your response. I'm disappointed that you didn't take your communication with members of this committee more seriously, and I expect that you will do that in the future. I again want to thank you all for being here today. I look forward to your testimony. And now I'd like to yield to our ranking member, Mr. Tonko, for the purposes of an opening statement. Thank you, and good morning. Uh, thank you, Chair Shimkus and Chair Whitfield for holding this hearing. And thank you, Chair McFarlane and Commissioners Fadiki, Apostolakis, Magwood, and Ostendorf for appearing before the subcommittees 
today. The work of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is extremely important to the public. Congress recognized way back in 1974 that the licensing and regulation of nuclear power and radioactive materials should be separate from research and development and promotion of the civilian nuclear industry. Public confidence in this technology is directly related to their confidence that the NRC will act to ensure the safe operation of nuclear power plants and the safe handling of nuclear materials. Nuclear power provides nearly 20 percent of our electricity nationally. If we are to continue to rely on nuclear power, we must maintain safe operations. And we must deal with nuclear waste in a manner that inspires public confidence and serves the needs of the 104 power plants that we have across our nation. It is a tall order and one that obviously comes with many challenges. The tragic events in Japan that occurred at the Fukushima Daiichi plant were a stark reminder of how important safety is to this industry. To the public, there is no such thing as a small nuclear accident. A large one is devastating. I encourage the NRC to take the steps necessary to implement the recommendations from the review of that tragedy to further improve the safety of our nation's nuclear power plants. Again, I thank you for being here this morning. I look forward to your testimony. I would like now to yield my remaining time to the ranking member of the Energy and Power Subcommittee, uh, Representative Rush. I want to thank you, Mr. Taka, for yielding. I want to thank the Chair, and I want to thank you, the Chairman, uh, Chairwoman McFarland, for all, and all the NRC commissioners for being here today. As a re representative of the great state of Illinois, which houses more nuclear reactors than any other state in the country, I'm eager to hear about the progress that the NRC is making in regards to the recommendations that the near-term task force released back in July 2011 following the nuclear disaster at Fukushima. My constituents want to be assured that the NRC adopts common sense protocols for both mitigating risk of a nuclear disaster as well as procedures to safeguard the public in the event that a disaster occurs. Safety is my primary concern, and I would support the implementation of a performance-based approach that will, follow, that will allow licensees to employ a combination of systems to address performance standards and avoid widespread disaster in the case of emergencies. Another issue of great importance to me is the NRC's work with the historical black colleges and universities, HBCUs. In May 2012, the NRC was honored as one of the government agencies that was most supportive of the engineering departments of HBCUs. And I look forward to hearing more about the types of programs and forms of support the NRC provides to these HBCU colleges and universities. It is in the national interest to make sure that we are educating all of our students to enter into the STEM field of, of science, technology, engineering, and math. And so it is very encouraging to hear that the nation's foremost nuclear authority is providing its support to help move our nation forward in this effort. I look forward to engaging the commissioners on these very important issues, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlemen, yields back the balance of time. Chair now recognizes the chairman of full committee, Mr. Upton, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, certainly, oversight of federal agencies is a very important responsibility for this committee, especially for the NRC. Given the broad scope of changes within the nuclear industry, and these are particularly two particular issues on my mind today, the NRC's reactor oversight process and the impact of the budget sequestration on the NRC. In 2000, the NRC's reactor oversight process was implemented under Chairman Meserve's leadership, a chairman well-respected on both sides of the aisle. 
The development of the process was very rigorous with the goal of creating an objective, measurable process that would provide an accurate representation of a plan's performance while minimizing subjectivity. Last year, the Palisades plant in my district spent time in column three, a designation for troubled plants which requires significantly increased inspections. This raised considerable concern among folks in my corner of the state, concerns certainly that I shared. Entergy needed to do better, and they outlined their comprehensive and methodical plans for returning Palisades to the high level of safety that all plants should have. This past November, the NRC returned Palisades back to column one, uh, the best column, which would normally signify the NRC's conclusion that the plant is operating safely and should give the local communities confidence that the plan is back, plant is back on the straight and narrow. However, when the NRC made the determination to move Palisades back into column one, the agency did so begrudgingly, I believe, and qualified the rating, indicating that it would continue to apply increased oversight beyond the normal inspections for column one. That, send, that does send a mixed message to the community. Does, policy, does Palisades belong in column one or not? And I would like some clarification on that. Closing, I'd like to echo the disappointment expressed by Chairman Shimkus regarding the NRC's response to our January letter. We do want a very, we did ask very detailed questions, uh, yet the response was somewhat dismissive even contradicting the Japanese Diet's report's conclusion that they had not fully considered the defense in depth philosophy, as Chairman Shimkus mentioned. You wrote that you would give us uh, careful consideration, but the answers were not quite where we'd like them to be. So uh, with that, I would yield back the balance of my time to Chairman Whitfield. Thank you very much, and I want to certainly welcome all the commissioners here today, we appreciate the important work that you do and recognize the importance of nuclear energy for pro uh, providing energy in our country. The uh, near, near term, the NRC near term task report, which was issued last summer, uh, highlighted some lessons learned from the Three Mile Island accident. Uh, some of the actions taken by the NRC after Three Mile Island were not subject to a structured review and were subsequently found not to be of substantial safety benefit and were removed. I'm concerned that the NRC's consideration of post-Fukushima issues is not as structured and integrated as it should be. I'd like to call your attention to just four items which appear to be interrelated but which the Commission is considering individually independent of each other. Number one, the near-term task force recommendation number one concerning the defense in-depth philosophy, which Chairman Shimkus mentioned. Number two, the severe accident management order the Commission issued a year ago. Number three, the filtered vents proposal about which we wrote to you. And then number four, the economic consequences proposal regarding the potential for land contamination. Um, from looking at records of the Commission, it's quite clear that many statements have been issued about how these issues are uh, related to each other, and yet it seems that the Commission is determined to treat each one separately in, in, in what some people say is an unstructured uh, process. The Commission's 211 decision to prioritize its work into three tiers was a good start. But time has passed and there's a great deal more information that has surfaced since then. It seems like a more integrated approach uh, to post-Fukushima issues is long overdue. Uh, so I hope that we have an opportunity to discuss that some uh, this morning and I would yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back the balance of time. With, uh, without objection, I'd like to be able to allow Mr. Wax when he arrives five minutes to do his opening statement and we will move right into uh, uh, questions until um, he arrives. Uh, so I'd like to recognize myself for the first uh, five minutes. Oh, we'll go to the commission. We're so anxious to talk to you all. So uh, uh, for the uh, chairman, uh, you recognize five minutes for your opening statement. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Shimkus. <clears throat> Good morning. Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, Chairman Shim Shimkus, Ranking Member Tomko, and distinguished members of the subcommittees. 
On behalf of the Commission, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you to discuss policy and governance at the NRC. When the Commission appeared before you last on July 24, 2012, I pledged to work closely with my fellow Commissioners and to approach my job as Chairman in a collaborative and collegial manner. Over the past seven months, we have developed a very productive, respectful, and collegial working relationship. In my tenure, I have also gained an even greater appreciation of the expertise of the NRC staff who carry out the mission of ensuring the safe and secure use of radioactive materials and protecting public health and safety in the environment. I believe the NRC is operating very well and is fulfilling its mandate. I am pleased with the NRC's commitment to use operating experience and insights to continuously improve and remain a strong and effective regulator. As we approach the second anniversary of the Great Tohoku Earthquake and the subsequent tsunami in Japan, I'd like to share my personal impressions from a recent visit to the Fukushima Daiichi site. I was struck by the deserted villages, abandoned roads, and rail lines that we passed on the drive to the plant. More than 160,000 people today are displaced from their homes there, and the site itself is scattered with twisted metal and debris from the force of hydrogen explosions in the reactor buildings, as well as the tsunami itself. While the Japanese are diligently working to clean up and decommission the site, it will take them many decades to complete. The NRC continues its work to apply lessons from Fukushima to the regulation of NRC-licensed nuclear facilities. You may recall that the NRC identified a series of recommendations that were subsequently prioritized into three categories or tiers. The NRC has already taken many actions on the near-term priorities and is now turning its attention to longer-term actions. We are actively exchanging lessons learned with the international community and maintaining a high level of open collaboration with the industry and public. Throughout this process, the agency remains determined to assure that the regulatory actions stemming from this review do not become a distraction from day-to-day -day safe plant operations. The NRC has approved license renewals for 73 reactors and continues to review additional applications. However, two reactors that had planned to operate an additional 20 years have recently announced their intention to permanently close due to economic factors. In the months and years ahead, the NRC will adjust our oversight from ensuring these reactors to operate safely to ensuring they will be decommissioned safely. Overall, the U.S. reactor fleet is performing well. There are a few reactors that have had significant performance problems, which the NRC is addressing in accordance with its regulatory procedures. Browns Ferry Unit 1 continues to address equipment problems. Fort Calhoun remains shut down and is as it addresses problems stemming from an inadequate flood strategy and a fire. And the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station has been shut down for more than a year due to unexpected degradation of the plant's replacement steam generators. The NRC will not allow any of our licensed facilities to operate unless we are satisfied that they can do so safely. Since the NRC issued the first combined operating licenses last year for new reactors at the Vogel and Summer sites in Georgia and South Carolina, construction has begun. Although there have been significant progress at both sites, there have also been some delays due to design impl implementation and fabrication issues. We anticipate that all necessary license amendments will be issued by the end of this week, which will permit both sites to begin pouring first nuclear concrete. Among other activities in the licensing and regulation of radioactive materials, the NRC is preparing to implement construction and operation, operating inspection programs for two newly licensed facilities, a uranium laser enrichment facility and a depleted uranium deconversion facility. We have also revised our regulations for the physical protection of spent fuel transportation and are preparing to publish a new rule to expand security measures for the physical protection of Category 1 and 2 byproduct material. The NRC staff continues to make progress in addressing the issues cited in the Court of Appeals decision on waste confidence. Our work is already well underway and on schedule for completion by September 2014. The Commission has directed that all affected license application review activities will continue, but the agency will not issue final licenses dependent upon the waste confidence decision until the Court's remand is addressed. The agency is actively engaging the public in the process. The NRC continues to make international cooperation a priority with active involvement in a variety of bilateral and multilateral initiatives. I recently assumed the chairmanship of the Multinational Design Evaluation Program 
an organization that strives to leverage the knowledge and resources of regulators to improve the design reviews of new commercial power reactors. In the next several months, the NRC will continue its focus on these and other important issues. I'm proud of our accomplishments and confident that we will address the challenges ahead with the same high quality work. I thank you for the opportunity to appear before you and would be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Now I'd like to turn to the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Waxman, for his five minute opening statement. Then we'll turn back to the commissioners for yours, hopefully two minute opening statements. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to begin by welcoming uh, Dr. Allison McFarland, the chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and her colleagues on the commission. Thank you all for being here today. By all accounts, Chairman McFarland has ushered in a new era of collegiality at the commission and I commend her for her leadership. The commission is grappling with a number of important matters that deserve our attention. In California, the San Onofre nuclear generation, generating station has been shut down for more than a year due to serious problems with the plant's brand new steam generators. The generators cost California ratepayers $670 million. This expense was large, but the new equipment was supposed to last for decades. Two of the steam generators did not even last a year. Southern California Edison has requested permission to restart one of the plant's two reactors. The Commission has an obligation to ensure that the reactor could operate safely before it is allowed to restart, and California residents are counting on the Commission to do its job carefully and with safety as, as its first priority. But the Commission should also look at its own actions to understand why it did not detect the design and manufacturing flaws in these steam generators before they were turned on. If the NRC had detected these problems before the generators were installed, California ratepayers could have saved hundreds of millions of dollars. The Commission also continues to address the safety gaps revealed by the Fukushima nuclear re accident in Japan, which happened almost two years ago. Last year, the Commission issued three orders to U.S. commercial nuclear reactors to enhance safety in the wake of the Fukushima disaster. Today is the deadline for operators to submit their plans for implementing these orders. Nuclear plant operators have until the end of 2016 to fully implement their plans to increase safety. It's important that this safety deadline does not slip as others have in the past. A major problem at Fukushima was that hydrogen gas built up in the reactor and eventually exploded when the pressure could not be released. One of the Commission's post-Fukushima orders requires reactors similar to the type used at Fukushima to install pressure venting systems that operate reliably in severe accident conditions. That's a common sense improvement and I commend the Commission for requiring that step. The Commission's technical experts recently recommended that the Commission go a step further to require these reactors to install filters on the vents in order to reduce the amount of radioactive material released with any vented gases. The NRC staff conducted a full cost-benefit analysis and concluded that the safety precaution would be amply justified. Safety should be the Commission's top priority, and I urge the Commission to approve the NRC staff's recommendation to require filtered vents as soon as uh, possible. I, I was pleased to hear uh, Chairman McFarland's testimony. I'm looking forward to the comments of her colleagues and for the opportunity to uh, ask questions uh, the, about these issues and other significant safety issues pending before the Commission. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back the time. Gentleman yields back his time. Chair now recognizes uh, Commissioner Savinicki for two minutes. Thank you, Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, Chairman Shimkus, Ranking Member Tonko, Chairman Upton, and distinguished members of the subcommittees for the opportunity to appear before you today at this oversight hearing to examine NRC policy and governance. Since the Commission appeared before you last summer, NRC has continued its important and diverse activities related to oversight and licensing of nuclear power plants, research, test, and training reactors, nuclear fuel cycle facilities, medical, industrial, and academic uses of radioactive materials, and the transport, storage, and disposal of radioactive materials and waste. Of these many diverse responsibilities, I will highlight two of current focus. 
The NRC continues to oversee industry compliance with the cybersecurity regulations that NRC put in place in 2009 to protect critical digital assets at nuclear facilities. Working cooperatively with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, the Department of Homeland Security, and other organizations, we continue to monitor and help combat the cyber threats to our nation. In the area of small modular reactors, the NRC continues its work to identify and resolve policy and licensing issues related to adapting our regulatory framework, which was developed for large light water reactors, to the diverse designs and approaches put forth by the small modular reactor community of developers. NRC policy encourages early discussion prior to submission of a license application between NRC agency staff and potential applicants in public meetings. These discussions enable the NRC staff to identify and resolve potential issues early in the process. These efforts will continue and will take more specific form as the U.S. Department of Energy advances its SMR program activities this year and next. All of these activities are achieved through the committed efforts of the women and men of the NRC who work to advance the NRC's mission of ensuring adequate protection of public health and safety and promoting the common defense and security day in and day out. I'm grateful to them for the work they do. I appreciate the opportunity to appear and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Chair recognizes Commissioner Aspostolakis for two minutes. We night make sure the microphone's on oh. and pull. Make sure it's pulled closely. Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, and members of the subcommittees, good morning. At the two-year anniversary of the accident at Fukushima, the NRC and the nuclear industry have made significant progress in addressing lessons learned. Decisions on nuclear safety matters should not be made without careful deliberation. Such deliberation includes the technical evaluations by NRC senior management, the views of the Statutory Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards, and public interactions with external stakeholders. As a result of this open and transparent process, the technical basis for implementing the near-term task force recommendations was strengthened. Additional technical issues for consideration were identified in such areas as filtration of containment vents, loss of the ultimate heat sink, and the expedited transfer of spent fuel to dry casks, uh, cask storage. The process for reaching post-Fukushima decisions has been and continues to be methodical and transparent. This decision-making process has highlighted the potential tension between implementing new safety enhancements and maintaining regulatory stability. Our own principles of good regulation state that NRC regulation should be perceived to be reliable and not unjustifiably in a state of transition. The agency will continue to face the challenge of striking the right balance between safety enhancements and regulatory stability. In closing, I note that there are many other safety improvements being made at nuclear power plants that are not related to Fukushima. These also require significant resources to implement. It is a challenge to ensure that additional new requirements do not adversely affect the implementation of more safety significant activities or our licensees' ability to maintain their focus on day-to-day -day safe operation. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Now, Commissioner Magwood, you're recognized for two minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, and good morning. Uh, Chairman Shemkus, Ranking Member Tomko, Chairman Whitfield, and Ranking Member Rush, and Chairman Upton, and distinguished members of the subcommittees, it's a pleasure to appear before you today to discuss the activities of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Two years after the massive earthquake struck northeastern Japan and precipitated the disaster at the Fukushima plant, responding to these impor the important lessons of that event remains a very high priority for our agency. While we continue to work with our Japanese friends and the international community to study the sequence of events at Fukushima to mine this tragedy for information that will help prevent future disasters, we've already learned the highest priority lessons. We understand that we must change the way we think about extreme events, what we in our business call beyond design basis events. These events are rare but can result in very high consequences. Fukushima has led to new thinking regarding how U.S. facilities should prepare for these occurrences. 
from Fukushima, we understand it's possible for a nuclear plant to experience the loss of both off-site power and on-site emergency diesel generators as a result of a single event. We've also seen that the unanticipated challenges associated with the failure of multiple reactors at a single site. This commission has led our agency to aggressively respond to these new learnings. We have issued orders to address these issues and many more. I believe that the great majority of risks revealed in the aftermath of Fukushima have been addressed by the actions we've taken thus far. Nevertheless, more work remains, both to implement successfully the decisions we've already made and to address remaining important issues, such as the, the, the improvements that can be considered regarding containment venting systems for Mark I and Mark II boiling water reactors. My colleagues and I have had many spirited open discussions and debates over these matters, and we have all spent countless hours with the excellent NRC staff as we, as we work to find the best solutions to these difficult issues and assure the health and safety of the American people. Meanwhile, the regular work of our agency continues. As our work continues, we appreciate your strong interest and have, that you have demonstrated in our activities and the ongoing efforts that we have in becoming a stronger, more effective, and more open nuclear safety regulator. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Commissioner Ostendorf for, for two minutes. Thank you, Chair. Chairman Mike may be also or closer. Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, thank you for the chance to be here today. As we approach the two-year anniversary of the Fukushima Daiichi event, I think that we are making very good progress at our agency in implementing previous actions and responsibly looking at what needs to be done and what does not need to be done. Along with all my colleagues here at this table, I know that we seriously take our responsibilities in making sure that we do not impose additional requirements without there being a strong justification. And I firmly believe as a commissioner that we are doing just that. With respect to our other work, safety performance of our licensees remains very good. When deficiencies are identified, we enhance our level of oversight and we ensure appropriate corrective actions are taken. We're also effectively providing construction oversight of new reactors in Georgia and South Carolina and are promptly addressing the waste confidence remand from the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. I appreciate this committee's oversight role. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. You get the you get the prize, Commissioner Otzendorf. So, uh, I'd like to now begin our opening round of questions. I'll recognize myself for the five, first five minutes. Um, as you all know, we are still waiting for a decision from the D.C. Circuit Court on whether the NRC is legally bound to resume consideration of the Yucca Mountain license application. Chairman McFarland, last July, when you last testified before this committee, I asked you if you would honor the court's decision, and you said, and I quote, "Absolutely." Do you still stand by that statement? Absolutely. To the rest of the commissioners, will you also commit to honor the court's decision? Yes, I do. Yes. Yes. Our investigation last year uncovered an estimate by NRC staff indicating that the Yucca Mountain Safety Evaluation Report could be completed in six to eight months. The safety evaluation report would document the NRC's review and conclusions regarding the license application. In answers to questions following our last hearing, the NRC stated the cost would be approximately $6.5 million. The NRC's performance and accountability report issued two weeks ago states that the NRC currently has $10.4 million in unobligated balances from the Nuclear Waste Fund for the purpose of reviewing the license application. And this to all five commissioners. Having committed to honor the court's decision, if the court orders the NRC to resume its review of the license application, will you commit to ensuring that staff will complete the review and publicly release the safety evaluation report in accordance with these time and resource estimates? Chairman? Uh, we, I, well, I will first wait to see what the court's decision is, and then I will wait to see the analysis of the available funds. So you don't uh, believe that you have 10.5 in unobligated uh, accounts in the NRC? We do. Whether it's released or not is, an, is another issue. And you don't agree that uh, you responded to last uh, appearance here that there was 6.5 and no, what was I, the projected I agree. cost? I agree to that. Yeah. And you have agreed that uh, if the court decides to move forward that you as the chairman of the commission would do so? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, same question to you, uh, Commissioner Savinicki. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I am the, the figures that you've mentioned, I believe, are correct. 
I do not know if the NRC staff would need to update the cost estimate for completing and issuing the SERs. The longer the duration of the suspension of their activities, it may be that reconstituting their work would be would have a higher price tag than that. But I have, uh, of course, any direction to the staff will be uh, deliberated amongst the commissioners. But as an individual member of the commission, I do believe there would be value in completing that work. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Apostolakis. I agree with Commissioner Sweeney. Great. Uh, Commissioner Magwood. Yes, I, I would echo that as well and also add that I, I think we also would require some additional guidance from, um, from, from Congress on that to assure we apply the money correctly, but uh, with all those constraints, absolutely. And Commissioner Ostendorf. Commissioner Sinkus, I, I agree there's value in moving forward to complete the SCRs and publicly issue those documents irrespective of what the long-term siding or repository may be. And final question, if the court issues such an order, will you commit to provide this committee with monthly reports on the staff's progress and expenditures of resources? Yes. Commissioner Savinicki? Yes. 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 Thank you very much. Now, Chair recognizes the gentleman um, from New York, Mr. Tonko, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, last March, the uh, Commission issued three orders to uh, United States commercial nuclear reactors to enhance safety in the wake of the uh, Fukushima disaster. One of the orders is focusing on boiling water reactors, similar to uh, the type used in Fukushima. The Indian Point nuclear facility south of my congressional district uses this type of reactor. NRC is requiring these reactors to install hydrogen venting systems that would be uh, reliable and operable under emergency conditions. Uh, that seems like common sense. And in fact, today is the deadline for operators to submit their plans for implementing these orders to the NRC. Chairman uh, McFarland, these reactors have until the end of 2016, I believe, at the latest to execute these plans. Is that correct? To execute that, I, I believe that's correct. That's more than five years after the Fukushima accident for only three orders. The post-Fukushima task force made many additional recommendations for how to improve reactor safety. Chair McFarland, how long will it take, uh, in your opinion, to implement all of the uh, Fukushima's task force's recommendations? Uh, this is a, an issue that we're looking at, and, and um, we are trying to, uh, we are evaluating a number of these recommendations going forward. As you know, we have prioritized them into three tiers. The first tier were the activities that could be conducted immediately without further study, and now we are evaluating the tier two and tier three activities to see if there is a reason to go forward with them. Um, but we are doing it with all due deliberation. Um, I appreciate that, but uh, I believe it's important to maintain a sense of urgency in the implementation of the lessons learned from Fukushima. As time passes, we tend to lose focus, but the hazards don't become any less real over the course of time. Um, I want to also ask you about another issue that seems like common sense, uh, and that's whether NRC should require the installation of filters on these hydrogen vents in order to reduce the amount of radiation released uh, into the outside air in the event of a severe accident. Mm -hmm. um, NRC's technical experts recommended uh, that the Commission require filtered vents. Some members of this committee uh, have raised concerns that this requirement would be too costly. Chair McFarland, my understanding is that the NRC staff did a full cost-benefit analysis examining both quantitative and qualitative factors. Is that correct? That is correct. And there's nothing unusual about looking at qualitative factors. Is that correct? That is correct. That's consistent with NRC's guidance on cost-benefit analyses? Yes. Okay. Well, based on its analysis, NRC staff determined that requiring uh, filtered vents would be cost-justified and would indeed uh, increase safety. Is that correct? That is the staff's analysis, yes. I know you're currently voting on this issue. We are. And um, I respect that process. Um, I believe that uh, you need to work together to come to a conclusion on this issue. But I would encourage you to resist outside pressure to disregard the expert recommendations um, of your staff. I think it's imperative. I think it's important that we move forward having learned from the lessons of Fukushima, and it's important for us to uh, maintain a sense of safety uh, with all of our nuclear activity across the country. So with that, I thank you, and Mr. Chair, I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. Chair Nowak is the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Upton, for five minutes. Well, again, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I do appreciate 
as I said in my opening statement, uh, your particular concern, as we all share with my particular plant in, in my district, uh, the Palisades plant, and uh, it is in the interest of all that that Palisades plant be returned to column one, which it was. I appreciated uh, you, you keeping us uh, updated. Uh, and as I indicated in my opening statement, you indicated as well that you're going to apply increased oversight beyond the normal inspections for that particular facility. Can you elaborate at all in terms of how long that might last, uh, what progress we've seen since you indicated such a number of weeks ago? Sure, sure. The, the increased oversight is a result of a degradation in safety culture that we observed at the, at the Palisades plant. And they, they had a few other issues, but this was the issue that prompted the, the increased oversight. And we're going to continue with the increased oversight to ensure that, that the changes, the positive changes that we've seen at the Palisades site in safety culture hold. And we'll continue that for a while to, uh, as long as we are convinced that changes have permanently taken place at the plant. And this is, uh, this is completely normal. This is what we do with other plants. Pa we're not singling out Palisades in any particular manner. And, and it is all moving in a very positive direction. Well, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate your, uh, your leadership, and I just uh, want to extend an invitation. Knowing, as you know, my district, uh, I have two facilities that uh, literally 10 miles north of where I live and 10 miles south, and uh, it would be an easy trip for you perhaps uh, to come visit both uh, on literally the same day. So I uh, appreciate your leadership, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. It's time. Chair now recognizes the ranking member of the Energy and Air Quality Committee, Mr. Rush, for five minutes. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairwoman uh, McFarland, uh, I'm going to switch the focus again uh, from the, some of the nuclear centered anxieties that is prevalent on this committee, and I want to focus on some of uh, what I consider one of your, your strengths that. As I, uh, in my opening statements, I uh, remarked uh, that I was pleased that the, to see the NRC being honored as one of the governmental agencies that was most supportive of the engineering departments uh, at HBCUs um, uh, in 2012. And I think that this is an issue that really we need some uh, uh, airing on in, in, in hearings of this type, and that's the issue of getting more students uh, to go into the STEM fields uh, uh, so that they can be the engineers, the scientists uh, uh, of the future. Uh, and I want to commend your agency again for its uh, uh, outstanding achievement. The API recently released a report that half of its industry will turn over in the next seven years, seven to ten years, uh, and is of our immediate national security interest that we make sure that we train our young people to become scientists and engineers and that they have the skills and the expertise that's necessary to replace the, this aging workforce. Uh, can you provide this uh, committee with more information on and what programs, more information on those programs, what forms of support the NRC provides to these uh, HBCUs, and uh, do you think that these programs, uh, these types of programs, can, can be replicated at uh, other agencies? Um, so we can certainly provide a list in, in writing. Uh, uh, on these programs, and uh, I think these programs are very important. Coming from an academic background myself, uh, I, I find them very important, and um, I've been uh, getting briefed from the staff on all the range of programs that we have. We have some very important programs to not only encourage students to go into these fields, but also to make sure there are faculty there to teach the students, um, and, and I think that's an important piece of this as well. So. These are very important programs. I don't know if my colleagues would like to comment. Anyway. Uh, sure, Congressman, uh, just a, a quick comment. I, I agree with Commissioner McFarland. I think these activities are very important. It's not, it's not simply um, programs aimed at HBCUs, obviously. It's really at the broader academic community. 
And uh, NRC has a unique role to play because it's not just simply the dollars that we put into this. It's also a lot of our, um, our staff who are very interested in these programs and serve as champions for various um, universities across the country uh, where they travel and I travel quite frequently um, to visit students and talk to students about uh, careers in science and technology and, you know, of course, particularly nuclear science and technology. Uh, but in the area of, of our um, minority serving institutions program, I think the biggest portion of the program is what we would call capacity building, um, building the ability of these um, universities to uh, compete on a more equal basis with larger universities uh, for research dollars and other types of grants. So it's something that we are very proud of. Uh, Ms. McFarland, uh, the NRC principles of good regulation state, and I quote, regulatory activities should be consistent with the degree of risk reduction they achieve. Where several effective alternatives are available, the option which minimizes the use of resources should be adopted. And once established, regulations should be perceived to be reliable and not unjustifiably in a state of transition. What specific measures do you employ to ensure that NRC's regulatory process provides the sufficient flexibility to satisfy these principles while ensuring a predictable and stable regulatory regime? Uh, we, we operate a number of different uh, processes to ensure that there's a stable regulatory regime. Um, and we work closely with industry and other <coughs> stakeholders to ensure that uh, we are going forward and we're sensitive to issues that come up. Gentlemen, you'll back his time. Chair recognizes the, the chairman of the Energy and Air Quality Committee, Mr. Whitfield, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Chimkus, and uh, thank you all for your statements. Uh, in my opening statement, I talked about <clears throat> The near-term task force recommendation number one concerning the, de the defense in depth philosophy, the severe accident management order, the filtered vents proposal, and the economic consequences proposal. And I noticed that after last July's hearing, uh, Commissioner Ostendorf, you uh, in, submitted a uh, answer to some questions we had submitted in which you supported an integrated prioritized assessment of the near-term force recommendations. And as I said in my opening statement, all of these issues seem to be so intertwined and yet there seems to be an effort at the commission to do them independent and separate of each other. Uh, would you give me your views on this issue? Thank you very much, Chairman Whitfield, for the question. It's a very important question. My personal views on this are as follows, that uh, there may be some externally who would criticize the NRC staff for the sequencing of these four issues that you've just raised. I take a different view, and I'll tell you that amongst the five of us, when we meet in our periodic meetings several times a month, one-on-one, -on -one, we discuss this exact issue. I would fear that for us to go back and tell our executive director for operations, go back and sequence this in the way you think it's appropriate, that we would be inappropriately delegating our own policy decision-making authority to our staff. I think it's incumbent upon us as decision-makers to take that integration prioritization function on these key policy issues and deal with them as a commission-level decision, not a staff decision. So for instance, if I could just add, in our economic consequences vote, right. and that's not, not been wrapped up, but we've all had lots of discussions on this, filtered bench vote, I think you will see when those votes are released for our processes, there has been significant consideration for the interlapping interconnection of these issues. Would any of the other commissioners like to make a comment? Yes, Chairman Whitfield, I, I agree with Commissioner Ostendorf. I would add that I think since our responses last summer individually and as a commission were trying to strike a balance between, as Congressman Rush just read, our commitment to a principle that the entire regulatory framework not be unjustifiably in a state of transition and the need to disposition some of these measures which have been under evaluation. So we're attempting to integrate 
as well as we can. But at the same time, if issues are held open even longer, we contribute to this state of a transition for the regulatory framework. So as we discuss with each other and we feel we're able, if we can disposition an individual issue, we think that, that getting that stabilized is beneficial. Let me add that I agree with both my colleagues uh, on this issue, and we have been discussing it uh, on a very regular basis. But I think what we're also benefiting from as the staff does more analysis is more information to help us really understand all the issues that are at play and exactly how we can deal with the overlap or the lack of overlap depending on the particular issue. So we are giving this due consideration. Please be assured. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, in addition to what my colleague said, there is one other element that plays a role in our decision-making process, and that is how long it would take to implement one of those recommendations. Ideally and logically, recommendation one should be the first one to deal with. But recommendation one requires time. It requires a rethinking of re the regulatory system. So I don't think any one of us would want us to still be working on recommendation one without doing anything else. Right. So there are other actions that we can take, and it's not an ideal situation, but again, there is this time pressure too, that you do want to do something, and uh, recommendation one will have to wait for a while. Yeah. Ms. Magwell. Not to be the only one to stay silent on the <laughs> issue, I guess I'll have to make some comment. Um, I, 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 th I think that um, the outcomes that we have been able to um, generate, I think have been, have been have been good. And that's not to say that we could not have had a more, um, I guess I say, a more coordinated approach to how these issues were sequenced and how we approached them. But to be honest, a lot of these issues have evolved a bit while we have been working on them. You know, we've merged some of the issues together so that they aren't independent decisions anymore. So our understanding of how to approach this has changed as we've gone forward. So it's easy to look backwards and say, well, I wish we could have done it this way, but I think the progress we've made so far has been so uh, positive that um, I'm hesitant to be overly critical of the fact that I would have liked to have seen one decision come before another. Well, thank you all so much for uh, talking about it. Thank you. Chairman's time uh, has expired. Chair now recognizes the ranking member full committee, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chair, Chair McFarland, I'd like to start by asking you about the problems of San Onofre. I mentioned it in my opening statement. The uh, nuclear generation, gen generating stations located near San Diego. In 2010 and 2011, new steam generators were placed in service at that plant. The project cost California ratepayers $670 million, but the new equipment was supposed to last for decades. However, since January 31 of last year, both reactors have been shut down after a tube in one of the unit's steam generators started leaking radioactive steam into the atmosphere. When you last testified before the committee, all five commissioners agreed that this is a serious safety issue that must be corrected before the plant restarts. The operator of the plant, Southern California Edison, is now proposing to run one of the units at 70 percent of power for five months. I know that NRC staff is evaluating that proposal. Uh, Ch Chair McFarland, would running a plant at less than full power for an extended period of time normally require an amendment to the plant's operating license? Uh, I, you know, we are in the process of evaluating the proposal by Southern California Edison for their restart. And we are also evaluating whether they understand the root cause of the problem with the steam generators. And we will, let me assure you, first of all, that we will not let the plant operate until we are assured that it can operate 100 percent safely. But my question is, and I thank you for that comment, is that if, if they're going to run this plant in less than full power, don't they require an amendment to the plant's operating license? Uh, I think this is in adjudicatory space right now, and so I can't comment on that particular issue. N NRC didn't detect the flaws in the generators before they were turned on. That raises important questions. How did this happen? How do we make sure it doesn't happen again? What progress has NRC made in answering these outstanding questions? Uh, 
the, ener the process for changing out steam generators at plants, and this has been done at uh, 65 plants across the country, 65 uh, reactors, they, we've done this over and over. Um, it's been a fairly straightforward process. So the situation at San Onofre is somewhat unique. Uh, but nonetheless, we are going back and evaluating whether we have the right procedures in place when these uh, big pieces of equipment are changed. So this is an active area. And how long do you figure that this is going to take? That what's going to take? This evaluation to know what NRC didn't do and should have done and will do in the future? Uh, I'm not sure, but we are in the process of, of determining lessons learned. And we will really move on with lessons learned once this uh, situation with San Onofre is completed. Okay. I, I want to turn to the issue of climate change and its impact on nuclear power plants. For years, scientists have warned that climate change will bring more extreme weather and flooding, more heat waves and droughts. We're now experiencing impacts consistent with these predictions. Uh, Chair McFarland, what is NRC doing to ensure that our nation's nuclear plants can operate safely, not only in the current climate, but in a warmer climate with more extreme weather? There are indications that climate change is already having a harmful impact on the nuclear sector. Last August, Dominion Power was forced to shut down a nuclear reactor at its Millstone Power Station in Connecticut because the power it needs to cool its reactor became too warm. Yes, I appreciate that question. I think it's important for us to evaluate all external hazards, including those that may be posed by climate change. Um, but I think the Fukushima accident showed us that we need to be aware of recent information in terms of uh, earthquake activity, tsunami, et cetera. So we need to be prepared for all of that. And in fact, we are moving in that direction uh, right now. One of the, in the Tier 1 activities from the Fukushima follow-on, uh, we have asked plants to reevaluate both the seismic and flooding hazard, and the flooding hazard is a broad hazard. It can be from riverine flooding, from too much rain, from uh, coastal storm surge, as we saw during Hurricane Sandy, uh, even from tsunami. So, and then as we move through our other... Well, are you aware of uh, other instances of nuclear plants shutting down or curtailing their output as a result of cooling water they depend on becoming either too warm or too scarce? Yes, if it goes beyond their licensing basis, they do have to shut down. Mm -hmm. uh, the Tennessee, Tennessee Valley Authority had to curtail its output of its Browns Ferry nuclear reactors in Alabama during summers of mm -hmm. 2011, 20, uh, 2010 and 2011 because the temperature of the river used for cooling waters became too hot. Exelon Corporation had to receive special permission from regulators last summer to continue to operate its Braidwood reactors in Illinois when their cooling water ponds temperature reached 102 degrees. The impact of climate change on our nation's nuclear power plants are real, <coughs> happening now, and I think it's going, even going to get worse in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. The gentleman yields back his time. Chair now recognizes the Chairman of Minerals from the full committee, Mr. Barton, for five minutes. <coughs> Thank you, um, both Chairman and Ranking Members subcommittees for holding this hearing. It's very, um, very uh, decent of the full commission to come before the, uh, the two subcommittees. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, several months ago, or maybe a month ago, the, myself and 20 other members sent you a letter asking some kind of general policy questions. And one of the questions we asked was uh, when uh, we could expect your commission to conduct a full regulatory review between the Japanese system and the United States system. Uh, and in spite of some of the things that you said to members of this committee uh, informally in private conversation, you didn't answer that question. And I was a little bit surprised. I, I, I didn't think that was a trick question. Um, do you want to enlighten the committee? why you were so non-responsive to such a basic baseline question? Well, let me uh, thank you for your question. I appreciate it. And I'm sorry you found our, our answer wanting. Um, and I'll, I'll start off, but I'll invite my colleagues to, uh, to uh, jump in because it was a letter, it was a response from all of us collectively. Um, uh, let me note, first of all, that operational experience is a foundational element in our work at the NRC. 
and the experiences at Fukushima represent experience that we need to learn from. Uh, we are, of course, aware of the situation with, uh, with Japan, and we are aware of the analyses that the Japanese have done themselves um, of, the, uh, of the accident and uh, their uh, conclusions. Nonetheless, I think the accident pointed out a number of issues that are important for us to learn from. For instance, prior to the accident, we had not imagined that more than one reactor could melt down at a single facility. So it's imperative for us to now consider that in our uh, regulatory analysis. Well, can we... Um, but let me invite my colleagues to uh, comment. Well, let me, let me just do a quick follow-up. Um, are you willing to commit to the committee right now that you will conduct such a full regulatory uh, review comparison? And if so, when might we expect that to be given to the um, committee uh, and the public? I think uh, that we are working um, with due, all due deliberation, very carefully considering the lessons learned from the Fukushima accident. Uh, and That's I think we are... That's not an answer to my question. I, you know, the, are you going to conduct a full regulatory review or not? I'm satisfied with the analysis and the, the progress that we're making at the agency. So you think you've already done it, even though you've I not think we've done an adequate job and we're Does the rest of the commission that. agree with that? That's a stunning statement if, if y'all all agree with that. Uh, Congressman Barton, if I, if I may, uh, predating Chairman McFarland's service on the commission, as an individual member, I did propose in a vote to my colleagues that the commission direct the staff to conduct a regulatory comparison. This was in uh, the months immediately preceding the event in Japan. Uh, in the process of working as a deliberative body, uh, my proposal was um, scoped down to a comparison of station blackout requirements. And I respect majorities, so I, I um, appreciate that my colleagues and the Commission supported a partial comparison at that time. I, I continue to believe that uh, a, a more complete comparison would be a good check for us even two years from the accident. It would allow us to be aware if we have any gaps that we have not yet addressed. But yeah. uh, again, I just, I, I our direction to the staff arises from a majority. I'm, I'm not trying to be argumentative, but I don't see how you can decide what to do going forward if you really don't do a thorough review of the two regulatory systems. Uh, that are currently in existence or were in existence at that time. I mean, I'm, um, so I don't Would the gentleman yield for the left? Sure, sure. And our point is this, collegiality is great, uh, but just signing a letter because that's the majority way instead if you have opposition and you have a better way to do it, stand your ground. We want you to be collegial, we want you to talk, but this, letter and this response is unacceptable to this committee and we would ask that we get it right and that you give us a thorough, a, a thorough analysis of the two systems. Now, I can assure you that most members of the committee on both sides of the aisle are not trying to uh, sandbag the commission. In fact, I would say to the contrary, uh, we're your biggest allies. So to be as non-responsive was was I won't say it's shocking because it's not the first time we've received such a non-response from a regulatory agency, but uh, uh, it it was disappointing. And with with that, I yield back. Gentleman's time expired. Chair now recognizes the other chairman emeritus of the full committee, uh, Mr. Dingle, for five minutes. I thank you for your courtesy and commend you for this hearing. Uh, yes or no question here. This is to the chairman. As you know, the Yucca Mountain facility remains unused, yet we're still generating nuclear waste at facilities across the country at a tremendous rate. Has the Commission considered whether the D.C. Circuit Court's 2012 decision and the lack of a permanent storage facility will affect the continuation of existing licenses or possibly invalidate them? Yes or no? It, they won't, it won't invalidate existing now, licenses. Now, if not, does the does the commission plan to do so? If, if, sorry, can you repeat the question? If not, does the commission plan to do so? To, to invalidate existing licenses? Well, what are you going to do? If, 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 if you've, you've already said, 
you've, you've given me an answer to the first part of the question. Does the commission plan then to take any further action here, such as terminating the use of the facility and, and reviewing or bringing to a halt the uh, development of the uh, nuclear power in the country? Uh, let me just ask a clarification. Are we talking about right. the waste Please conflict? Please submit the answer uh, in written form. And, Mr. Chairman, I'll submit uh, questions to the Commission. Which Without I objection, all members will be able to yes. submit uh, questions to the Commission for a response. Now, Madam Chairman, uh, would you submit then additional information on this subject for the record to the Committee? I will be submitting to you an appropriate letter on this matter. Now, this again, yes or no. The nuclear industry has been ahead of many industries in cybersecurity efforts, and the Commission has robust cyber regulations already in place. Do you believe the Commission has the necessary authority and resources to do all you can to defend against cybersecurity threats and breaches and to prepare for future threats? Could you answer this yes, yes. or no? Yes. Uh, again, Mr. Chairman, I'll be submitting some questions on this point for the record. Uh, Madam Chairman, in addition to the nuclear facilities and the computer infrastructures that support them, Nuclear facilities could potentially be disrupted through off-site attacks, such as attacks to the, on the mines or transportation or on other activities of the companies that manufacture parts. If reactor fuels, parts, equipment, or other pro products are qualified to come on site, should the Commission have jurisdiction or input over cyber or physical protection before it comes on site, yes or no? We are beginning to look into this issue. All right. And, and again, I will submit some, some questions on this. Uh, Madam Chairman, the Fukushima disaster obviously gave us a lot to think about when it comes to nuclear energy. And the Commission has put considerable thought into this matter. However, in a recent letter to the Commission, I joined my committee colleague, Mr. Barrow, uh, for whom I have great respect, and others to express concern about a pending decision that may require a significant number of nuclear facilities to install containment filtered vents. The concern is it may not be appropriate for the facilities your decision may affect. Due to the differences in affected reactors, would a case-by-case -case evaluation provide greater certainty that the best technologies are being used rather than a broad approach such as a filtered vent proposal? Yes or no? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. I didn't, under, I didn't get the question. Well, I'm running, I'm running out of time. The, the, uh, the filtered vents issue is still an active area of voting, so I'm not going to talk about it right now, in, 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 with all respect to my colleagues. Thank you. I'll, I'll submit again questions on this. In regards to other Fukushima recommendations already put, in place, please submit for the record why these were issued as orders and not through the rulemaking process. Why did you sub why did you why did you uh, issue these as orders and not through the rulemaking process? Because we felt that these uh, particular activities were activities that needed to be accomplished very quickly. Rulemaking is a very time-consuming process. And in response to what we now know about what can happen at reactors based on the Fukushima accident. Now, they will be submitted rather imperfectly, and this is going to require further refinement by the Commission, is it not? Yes, we are in, we are in rulemaking mode as well. Now, Madam Chairman, and, uh, I submitted a question to you last year with regard to the status of an application by Aerotest Operations for an indirect license transfer to Nuclear lab Labyrinth. In your written response, you indicated that the Commission would request additional information from Aerotest. It's my understanding that such additional information has been submitted. Does the Commission anticipate requesting further information to Aerotest? The uh, information was submitted, I believe, in Jan this past January, and it will take between six to eight months for us to review this. Would you please submit for the record your timeline on this? And Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your courtesy. 
Gentlemen's time has expired. <laughs> Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Gingry, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you uh, for the recognition. Since we are somewhat rushed for time, I think we have fl uh, floor votes coming up soon. Let me get right to the questions, and I'm going to go uh, starting with uh, Chairwoman McFarland, and I want each of the commissioners to respond to this, if you will. To me, it seems abundantly clear that this administration unilaterally decided to ignore the Nuclear Waste Policy Act and indeed cancel Yucca Mountain, our nation's only nuclear waste repository program. Subsequently, the Commission's waste confidence rule was vacated by the D.C. Circuit Court, which rebuked the Commission when it wrote, the Commission apparently has no long-term plan other than hoping for a geologic repository. As a result, you have a two-year moratorium now on issuing new plant licenses or renewals for existing plants. For each of the commissioners, again, uh, Chairwoman McFarland, I'll start with you, wouldn't simply following the law, wouldn't simply following the law and reconstituting the Yucca Mountain program reestablish a basis for confidence that there will be a disposal path for spent nuclear fuel? This issue, the issue, the Yucca Mountain issue, is in the courts right now, and we will await the decision of the courts, and we will follow the law. Please. Uh, yes, I uh, believe that having a clarity in both the um, language of the law and its implementation uh, would allow the NRC to continue its licensing activities, which uh, I, I suppose I'm just observing that if the national policy for disposal of these materials is uncertain, then these types of legal com complications such as waste confidence arise in our licensing activity. I agree with Chairman McFarland. I think, I think it's, it's, it's quite evident that the fact that there is uncertainty in national policy created the situation we have with waste confidence. So I think the answer to your question obviously is yes. But I would also stress that I believe that our original waste confidence uh, decision from 2010 was, in my view, and remains, uh, my, my view, was appropriate. So I, I, I still think that was a, a good waste confidence determination at the time, despite the fact the court didn't agree with me on that. Congressman, I agree with Commissioner Magwood. I voted on that waste confidence decision when I first got to the Commission, along with other colleagues here. I believe that we recognized it was the Department of Energy's responsibility under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act to establish a repository. We had good faith that they would follow that law. The law should be followed or amended. Mr. Chairman, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I have a list of the license and actions subject to the moratorium issued by the Commission. Uh, this is the list, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I would like unanimous consent that this document be included in our record. Is there objection? Hearing none, so ordered. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. On the third page of this document, listed are two independent spent fuel storage installations. That's a fancy word for interim storage, uh, of which we have 68 uh, as I understand across the country, 68 different interim storage facilities. So there are two that can't get their existing license renewed because of this waste confidence moratorium. There are some individuals that probably hope that interim storage will fix the waste confidence problem, but that looks like a catch-22 to me. Can each of you comment, again, starting with the chairwoman, can each of you comment on how interim storage can solve waste confidence if you cannot license it because of the moratorium? First of all, let me point out that the resolving of the waste problems is the purview of the Congress and the administration and not the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Our job is to ensure that any interim storage facilities, any repositories, if so deemed by law, um, if that's our role, then we ensure If the gentleman leave, it is the law of the land. So uh, right. this, uh, right. just for a record, I think no one in a basic reading of the law would say that Yucca Mountain is not the law of the land. Yeah, I'm not trying to say that Yucca Mountain is not the law of the land. I'm just uh, clarifying our role yeah. as 
as regulators. Why don't we move along pretty quickly? I'm running out of time. I'd like to hear from each one of the commissioners on this as well. Uh, Congressman, I would only observe that the uh, commission, I believe, has crafted a response to the adverse court decision which is not dependent on legislative action. We have directed our staff to remedy and rehabilitate both the rulemaking and the environmental impact statement that the court found lacking. Once that activity is complete, our ability to issue licenses and the legal underpinning for that will be restored. I agree. Yes, I, I agree with Commissioner Savinikin. I also agree. Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman's time expired. Chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Capps, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for your testimony. And uh, Chairwoman McFarland, as we've discussed before, um, Diablo Canyon Power Plant is located in my congressional district. Diablo Canyon is the largest private employer in the area. PG&E, which operates the plant, does a lot of great work. I visited there several times over the years, and I want to thank you for taking the time to visit uh, the plant earlier this year. Now, we've known for a long time that the, this nuclear plant sits on the Hosgree Fault, earthquake fault. But in 2008, the U.S. Geological Survey discovered a new fault called the Shoreline Fault. The Energy Commission recommended, and our state PUC directed, that the utility conduct independent peer-reviewed advanced seismic studies prior to applying for relicensing. As you know, PG&E asked to have the relicensing request paused pending completion of these studies, and then RC granted their request, and I supported that action. PG&E came up with a plan for the studies, but the Coastal Commission, uh, California's Coastal Commission, rejected it last year due to environmental concerns. I was similarly concerned about these impacts on marine life, which is why I supported making it a limited pilot program. But the health and safety of my constituents is my top priority, and I strongly believe that additional study of the fault is needed before the relicensing process can move forward. While I understand this effort has been driven by the state, I would hope the NRC would also want to have the best, most up-to-date information about this fault. Chairman McFarland, do you also agree that having additional independent data on the shoreline fault would be helpful? And I'd appreciate you just say yes or no. Additional information can always be helpful, but right. we can operate with the information that But we you have. do agree that more information is a good thing? I agree in general that more information is a good thing. Last October, the NRC published a research information letter claiming that Diablo Canyon is seismically safe. Yet there are other scientific studies that seem to conflict with the NRC's report, and I'm holding up one. USGS seismologist Dr. Gene Harderbeck, who discovered the shoreline fault, just published an article in the peer-reviewed Bulletin of Seismology Society of America, which says, and this is a quote, much is unknown about the shoreline fault. This raises concerns for me and my constituents that there are still unanswered questions about the seismic situation. So, Chairwoman McFarland, how can we ensure that these questions and concerns are properly addressed? Well, fortunately, right now there's an ongoing process. Uh, there's a committee called the Senior Seismic Hazard Assessment Committee that is actively evaluating the seismic situation at uh, Diablo Canyon, and they're in the middle of their process. Okay. We are observing this process, and we're looking to see what the outcome is. And the fact remains that another federal scientist in a peer-reviewed study says more information is needed, so we clearly need to figure this out. I think we all can agree that every angle must be thoroughly examined. NRC analysis needs to be incorporated, needs to incorporate independent concrete data that can be tested against those of seismic experts like Dr. Harderbeck. I think it makes sense to have the best eyes and minds in the country working together, looking at these seismic issues because actually, first and foremost, this is about safety. The NRC has a responsibility to make sure that Diablo Canyon is as safe as it can be today, but also in the future. And I wanted the record to note that, we, that Diablo Canyon and the NRC have more than a decade to make these decisions because these licenses don't expire on, until a decade from now. So there's no rush. And we must work together to find a responsible way to gather and consider the additional data before relicensing moves forward. Chairwoman McFarland, I hope you share this commitment, and I look forward to working with the NRC to ensure that this process is done right. And 
for the record, I do have some additional questions for the chairwoman and for other members of the panel, but I'm going to submit those for the record and I look forward to their response. But I do have 45 seconds left and I want to know if there's another response that you'd like to give now or any of the other members of the commission about this very urgent need at the nuclear facility in my uh, congressional district. I think it's important that we make sure that these plants are, can operate safely. I agree with you, but I'll offer my colleagues an option to comment. All right, I yield back. The gentleman yields back her time. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman, uh, Chairwoman McFarlane, uh, I represent uh, uh, Fort Calhoun, and you did mention uh, Fort Calhoun uh, in your written statement, uh, and so I'm, I, I want to follow up and, and ask a specific question uh, regarding the NRC's uh, relationship with uh, the folks at Fort Calhoun and Omaha Public Power. Uh, I meet with them fairly regularly on the status of Fort Calhoun. I don't meet with you regularly on it. Uh, my question as a layman, uh, reading newspaper articles and hearing about their continuous meetings, uh, what I'm concerned about is it seems about every uh, six, seven or months, the NRCC issues a new list uh, of to do things uh, for that plant before it could reopen. So it appears to me as a layperson that the NRCC may not have uh, all of its organization skills applied here in the sense that it just seems like they get really close to being able to reopen and then all of a sudden they get this new list. Why and how does that happen? Uh, I think we're working deliberately, again, carefully with Fort Calhoun. And, and as you know, there were a number of issues that arose at the site, uh, I think it was in 2011, in the summer of 2011. First the flooding issue and then a and fire. And the fire. Right. And then there were a number of significant safety culture issues. As you know, Omaha Pal Power Public District has now contracted with Exelon right. to operate the site. So it's a matter of getting but those Exelon folks in reestablishing a stability right. at the site and addressing the issues. Are, are you exist. familiar with the Fort Calhoun and, and that process? Yes, I have not okay. visited the site. Because you're speaking, uh, you're, you're, you're at a general level here. We know, I already know about Exelon. And there was an additional punch list once the approval of Exelon to come in and help with the management culture there. Uh, and those manage, and as I understand the new punch list, it didn't really have much to do with the management aspect, but physical things in that right. plan. And it just seems odd that those physical things were there a year and a half ago, but they weren't on your list. And that's, that, that gives me concern that, well, that there EA, there's another agenda out there, it leads to questions like that. I just want to put that out there no, for you. No, you know, this is, I, I understand your concern. And a, num num a couple of these issues have come up as a result of the licensee discovering some of these issues. Some of yeah. them have to do with electrical penetrations into the containment building. Uh, there are a number of technical issues like this that the licensee noticed, and therefore we okay. it's are under obligation to ensure that these particular issues are addressed. Fair. I would invite my colleagues to Well, I just, uh, I'm going to go on to my next question, and, and because of your... Uh, <laughs> situation and incidences that occurred internally, we wrote a bill uh, for reform of the NRC. Uh, geez, uh, a couple years ago, 3657. Are you familiar with that bill? I am familiar. It has not been reintroduced, comma, yet. Uh, so uh, is, I'm going to go down the list. Is everyone familiar with that bill, Sminicky? Yes. Okay. And uh, so one of the major parts of that uh, is about the declaration of emergencies. That seemed to be one of the abuses that was identified. So do you believe that the chairman should officially declare an emergency to the commission and to Congress before assuming emergency powers? And I'm going to go from you, Chairman, on down. I think the, the chairman should certainly 
con uh, consult with his colleagues, his or her colleagues, uh, when declaring an emergency. And to Congress. And to Congress. I, I think certainly members of the Commission need to be notified, and uh, there needs to be an official declaration. Yes, I agree. Yes, it should be an official declaration. Yes. Uh, I have three more questions that I cannot ask in eight, 17 seconds. Uh, Mr. Magwood, I just want to thank you for your strength during a difficult process before uh, Chairman Magwood, uh, uh, McFarlane, sorry, got there. So good job. Yield back. Gentleman yields back to the time. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castor, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, and thanks to the commissioners for your testimony this morning. Uh, over the past five years or so, certain ratepayers in Florida have struggled with the cost and uncertainty uh, of the Crystal River, River nuclear power plant uh, north of Tampa Bay. In 2009, the previous owner of the plant embarked on uh, what, somewhat typical repairs to the plant. But during those repairs, the containment wall was seriously cracked. And the new owner uh, announced earlier this month its intent to close the plant. That's the first closure of a nuclear power plant in Florida, the first major closure of a plant in the southeastern United States. Uh, so I understand the utility and the NRC uh, face two choices on how to decommission. Uh, the, the plant. It, you can either decontaminate it quickly over time, uh, called decon uh, under the NRC lingo, or over 60 years a process known as safe storage, where the radioactivity decays over time. Uh, the utility uh, announced that they are choosing the latter option. At, what is the role of the NRC? Do you agree with that? What what analysis goes into uh, those options? What is your role? Do you agree with that decision? Our role are um, those options are both options that are available under our regulatory framework. So a, a plant can decide to decommission immediately, such as uh, what was done at uh, Maine Yankee, or it can decide to put the plant in safe store for up to 60 years uh, before finally decommissioning the site. Um, so those are all available within our purview, and our, our role is to ensure that whichever path is chosen is carried out safely and securely. What are the pros and cons of, uh, I know. I think that that's par in part up to the licensee to decide what the pros and cons are. So you're, the NRC's role is not to uh, provide direction. No. The, the rules provide that they can choose no. either option and then you provide uh, oversight. oversight and input once yeah. that option is selected? Yes. Mm -hmm. Correct. Because it's, it's interesting that uh, the estimates I've seen that decommissioning the plant quickly would cost under a billion dollars while safe storage over 60 years could cost over uh, six billion dollars. Uh, does that sound correct in the ballpark? Um, I'm not sure for that particular facility at Crystal River. I don't know, maybe my colleagues comment? No. Uh, there's just a lot of sensitivity because in Florida there was an, a, an advanced recovery fee and ratepayers have been on the hook for uh, future construction. They may be left on the hook for very, uh, for very significant sums of money for a plant that was never repaired, one that may not be built, alternative fuel. Uh, so that kind of cost benefit analysis does not enter into your oversight responsibility? No, that's a cost-benefit analysis that would be done by the uh, licensing. Okay, so at this point, once they have selected the, the safe store option, what kind of oversight do you provide on that process? What kind of input? How, how involved? What kind of staff requirements? Uh, can you go into a little more detail on that, please? We uh, provide oversight to make sure that what, is, what remains at the facility remains in a safe and secure manner, and so we will continually inspect it to make sure that that, that occurs. So continually, how often are you in contact with the, the utility, and are you on, how often are you on site? 
uh, maybe it may, maybe it will be necessary for you all to, to meet with me uh, after the hearing to to sure, go through absolutely. those details. Sure, or we can provide go. That I'm happy writing. to go through the details of all of this so that you understand the whole process. Okay. Okay. Does the impending sequester uh, across the board cuts through all government government agencies affect your ability to? Uh, on what you would plan to do on the oversight of the decommissioning process for No, it, it won't. We, we will ensure that uh, our main mission, which is to ensure the operating facilities and decommissioned facilities, shutdown facilities, will remain in safe uh, and secure. Does it affect it at all? No. Okay. Thank you very much. I yield back. General, I yield back our time. Chair now recognizes the Vice Chairman of the Energy and Air Quality Subcommittee, Mr. Scalise, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate all of our panelists coming uh, and engaging in this hearing. In March 2011 information paper to the Commission, the NRC set, uh, staff had cautioned that the cumulative effects of regulation, quote, can potentially distract licensee or entity staff from executing other primary duties that ensure safety or security. And, you know, I've looked at this, this cumulative effect risk and it seems valid. Uh, I want to see, uh, we got the slide up. If you can turn your attention to the slide on the screen, this is a timeline of the regulatory actions an average owner of four reactors would need to comply with. Uh, clearly, this represents a lot of new requirements in addition to what we already expect of them every day uh, to, to safely and reliably operate their plants. We raised this matter in the following uh, uh, our, our hearing last July, and the NRC's response was, quote, process enhancements focus more on scheduling and less on reducing or scaling back requirements. We raised this issue again in our January 15th letter in the NRC's response was, quote, the staff is currently working with industry to understand the impact of implementation dates and mentioned the timely development of guidance. So, you know, more regulation is not always safer. Sometimes it's just more things that they have to do that take away from their primary safety responsibility. You know, I don't know how anyone can look at this slide and dismiss the cumulative impact of regulations is merely a matter of scheduling. And I'm told, in addition to this, there are approximately 40 more post-Fukushima items yet to be considered. Uh, is that correct? We are in the process of considering a number of post-Fukushima activities. Do you know how many? I'm uh, told it's around 40. Is, it, is that an accurate assessment, or do you know an exact number? It's, I think it's higher or lower? It's lower. How much lower? Uh, depends on exactly how specific you want to get. <laughs> well, I mean, if you know it's less than 40, then you know it is some number below that. So what would you, right. we'll 30 maybe? You with the specific exact number for the record. Okay, you could, so you will get that back yeah. to, to the committee. But that the, does not mean we will decide to enforce all of those activities. Those are things that we are, are, are under consideration. Well, you know, and then that's on top of what everybody's already expected to do. And you know, and I guess that gets to a question of priorities. If, you know, at some point, if you're not going to enforce all of them, then you've got to establish some set of priorities, and I would have. expect, because you have that. Yes, we have a set of priorities. Post do, Fukushima, the near-term task Do the people force, who operate all the reactors know what those priorities are that you're do. going to enforce? Yes, they do. Okay, and if you can get that to us as well, sure. can, can you do that? You know, because we all want the same thing. We want safety. We want the nuclear plants to be safe. Uh, but you've repeatedly indicated that our plants are safe and that regulatory changes are often referred to as safety enhancements. So what I'd like to know from the panel is how to seriously tackle the cumulative impacts of these regulations. Uh, who would well, like to go first? If you We have been working, talking with industry uh, I, um, on these issues. I know this is an area of concern for them, and we are concerned that we do not want to distract licensees from their main mission of ensuring safety at the facilities, of course. Uh, at the same time, I think it's our job to impose whatever requirements are needed to provide ad adequate protection of public health and safety. But are you going to impose things that you yourself know you're not even going to enforce? I mean, is that, is that really the responsible thing to do? Everything we impose, we will enforce, of course. But let me, let me ask my colleagues to yeah. comment, because I think they would like to. About three weeks ago, the Commission directed the staff to do two broad things. The first one is, well, to propose ways of achieving these things. Uh, a prioritization of new requirements or potential requirements with uh, 
existing requirements. For example, when we received the Fukushima report from the near-term task force, we just prioritized the Fukushima recommendations regardless of what else was going on. So now we are asking the staff to actually consider what else is going on in the future and give a prioritization of everything. And second, we are asking the staff, directing the staff to come up with options for uh, giving the licensees the option of arguing back why certain requirements they should delay because they're doing something else that's more safety significance, of, of more safety significance. And to do that, they would have to use uh, probabilistic risk assessment. So, okay. and, and real quick, I apologize, I've got three seconds left. I just want to ask, when you're sending that list, what, 30 or whatever the number is going to be of, of those new items, does that include new regulatory guides, issuing new generic communications, using revised interim staff guidance, developing inspection findings, disposition of license, amendment requests? Are those what would be included in that list, or would that be outside of that is, that these, might also be coming? These are issues that we are, un, that are under consideration. These aren't um, decisions that we've made yet. Okay. So as you get those, if you could share those with us. Thank you very much. I yield back. Gentlemen's time expired. The chair now recognizes gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So many questions, so little time. <laughs> um, uh, Commissioner Senviki, sorry. Um, how, uh, how does the security of nuclear plants compare to conventional power plants with regard to cyber attacks? Uh, I would say that the NRC has some of the, I think, uh, most specific and strongest regulations in the cyber area. As um, I mentioned, in 2009, NRC was able and had the authority to put in place cybersecurity regulations that have the licensees identify all of what we term critical digital assets at the site and then uh, propose a security plan to the NRC. We've received those from all of our power plant licensees. We have reviewed them, and I believe that we have begun our process of uh, inspecting to those cybersecurity plans that are in place. So they may be more secure than our conventional plants. For I can't. I, I have visited one fossil plant, but I, di I did not discuss cybersecurity there, so I'm not certain. Is there any legislation needed to enable the nuclear plants uh, to secure themselves from t cyber attack? Um, it, in my time on the Commission since 2008, the Commission has looked uh, very actively at our legal authorities, and we've not identified anything that I, is any gaps that we have. So we do not seek any additional authorities in this area. We feel that we have a very robust authority. Thank you. Um, one or two other questions for you. Uh, small modular reactors. How long might it take for a competent power producer to get a license for a small modular reactor? Are there any licenses out there now? Um, there are not, and we have no pending uh, designs that are undergoing review right now. We do anticipate with the Department of Energy's program now, they made a selection of a technology for their program uh, late last year. Uh, we expect that we may receive that application in, I think, either late 2013 or 2014, I believe. Chairman McFarland says it will be 2014. Are, are there any foundries in the United States capable of producing uh, the, the stainless, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, containment vessels, the, the uh, containment vessels for these reactors? I, I think I'd like to take that question for the record to be certain of being accurate in my response, but I believe that the uh, intention is that the small modular reactors would have components, a substantial portion of which would be able to be manufactured here in the United States. But the large contained vessel you're not sure of? I, I'm not certain for the various designs that are proposed for small modular reactors. I'm not sure of the largest of the sizes of those. I don't know if any of my colleagues are. How about for... Uh, uh, the, the, the other kind of uh, nuclear reactors. Are there founders For the capable large of light water those? reactors, there are not U.S. Uh, facilities. Okay. Com um, Chairman McFarland, you're uh, a true expert in nuclear waste. Is that correct? That's correct. You mentioned in your uh, testimony the laser uranium <coughs> uh, enrichment facilities. Mm -hmm. Are those <coughs> also used in processing nuclear waste? No. <coughs> Excuse me. No, they're not. Do you see um, other facilities for nuclear waste than Yucca Mountain on the horizon that could be acceptable within a 20-year time frame? Uh, I think uh, what is acceptable is, is in, in, in what 
policies developed is in part dependent on what uh, occurs in Congress and, uh, and the administration. Um, in the original Nuclear Waste Policy Act, there was always a question of a second repository. And uh, currently, the, the Yucca Mountain Repository was to be uh, statutorily bound by a certain amount, certain volume of material. That volume is already exceeded at reactors. So there's an open question about a second repository. In a, <clears throat> excuse me, in a futuristic sense, do you see nuclear waste becoming valuable in its own right uh, within the next 20 or 50 years? Not my area of uh, expertise. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. Chair, now I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Burgess, for five minutes. Yeah, I thank the chairman for the recognition. <clears throat> Commissioner Savinicki, um, let me ask you a question. In your opening remarks, you made mention of the fact of the, uh, the ability to, to, to re-energize or, or re revisit Yucca Mountain would depend not only on the funding but the degree to which the data collected during the license application uh, the degree to which that data has, has degraded over time. Now, I was fortunate enough to go with Chairman Shimkus to Yucca Mountain two years ago. At that point, they were six months into their appropriations lapse, and the gentleman who showed us around that day did make mention of the fact that uh, there will over time be an attrition of that data or a degradation of that data. And it appeared to me that there was a lot of material collected during that license application, but do you have a sense as to, uh, you know, we st always talk about the half-life of nuclear material, but do you have a sense about the half-life of this data that has been collected during the licensing application and how long the inactivity of the Congress or the Commission will, will how that will harm your, the ability to reclaim that data? Congressman, uh, my testimony in response to the prior question uh, discussed the fact that the longer that activities have been in suspension, the more challenging and expensive the reconstitution is, or a reconstitution may even be imperiled. Although you're mentioning data and analysis, what I had in my mind when I made that statement was actually people and experts and scientists. I know that the NRC, since the suspension of its Yucca Mountain activities, has had the retirements of scientists who had been on this project for over 20 years. And uh, also, we have reassigned individuals. Uh, conceptually, they may be available then to be brought back to this work. But uh, there is additionally, as you mentioned, at Yucca Mountain, there were physical samples and core borings. The quality and chain of custody of those to the licensing process was a very, very important matter. I don't know the state of DOE's preservation of any of that chain of custody of those materials for the purposes of us relying upon them in a scientific investigation. So I think there are many dimensions to the challenges of reconstitution, but time is the enemy. Yeah, there's a big machinery that was in use that seemed to be just out in the weather and had daisies growing out of the treads and that sort of thing, which just you really had to wonder this funding lapse or this appropriations lapse is, is, is very damaging. And, you know, the real loser here is the, is the poor consumer who has funded this for years with surcharges on their bill with the expectation that in the future their reliability and their supply of electricity would be assured because the federal government was in fact taking care of this problem of long-term storage. Is that a fair statement? Yes, it is. And I do want to acknowledge uh, the fact that you have been very responsive to my office and my staff, and I appreciate that. Uh, I was also concerned when uh, the, the, the Fukushima reactor went down, the damage or danger from the, the rods in the spent, spent fuel pools um, provided some reassurance to us that that was not as big a problem as, as it appeared in the press. So I, I was grateful for your, for your input that day. Uh, Commissioner McFarland, Chairman McFarland, can I ask you a question? I have a, a letter here from the National Mining Association to you dated from January 7th of this year, and they, they have <clears throat> several points that they were making, but the lead point and one that's of concern to uranium producers in my area, North Texas, is the relicensing uh, applications that uh, apparently are pretty expensive. Their fees are pretty expensive, and yet they're told by the... By the uh, Commission that the staff man hours are not there to be able to process those relicensing applications because of lack of funding, but it does seem like they're funding that activity with their application fees. What am I missing here? 
No, I think we have, uh, my understanding is we have adequate staff to, uh, to deal with the new applications and the relicensing applications. Uh, the issue uh, sometimes is that we don't get complete applications, and so there's a, a period of back and forth with the uh, licensees. Well, and again, the opinion of this letter the submitted by the National Mining Association was these applications were submitted in their in entirety and that they, they were complete. I would appreciate if uh, some follow-up sure. on this because clearly there is, a, there is a concern. And Mr. Chairman, I'd ask unanimous consent to put the National Mining Association letter into the record. Is there objection? Hearing none, so ordered. Since you were so compliant, I'll yield back my eight seconds. <laughs> it's a, a historical event. You're yielding back time. Chair now recognizes the gentlelady from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Christensen, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everyone. Um, in addition to the three orders to commercial nuclear reactors in the U.S. in order to address the safety concerns raised by the Fukushima accident in Japan that you issued last year, the NRC also required all commercial nuclear reactors to perform inspections or walk-downs to verify that they're prepared to respond to flooding earthquakes as required in their licenses and that all necessary equipment to respond to such events is available, functional, and properly maintained. Chairman McFarlane, I understand that all operators have completed walk-downs of, of their facilities? They have. Great. And what did the walk-downs find? Did they raise any red flags about the preparedness of U.S. nuclear the fleet to respond to a serious flood or seismic event? Uh, I appreciate the question. Um, they, they, uh, most plants were just fine, only minor uh, discrepancies. Uh, a few plants identified more significant issues in the flooding walkdowns, uh, in the seismic walkdowns, no significant issues to date. Okay, and the NRC, as I understand it, asked the U.S. commercial reactors to go a step further and reevaluate their flood and seismic hazards um, and compare any newly identified hazards with the extreme events the plants are designed to withstand. What was the goal of the reevaluations? Or was that just for the few plants that... Well, this, the reevaluation actually was begun even before Fukushima, the Fukushima accident, and then it was folded into uh, the Fukushima recommendations. But the goal is to bring the plants and their uh, seismic hazard analysis and flooding hazard analysis into up-to-date uh, current information that's available in the earth sciences. So it's, it's updating... Uh, the hazard analysis at all these facilities. I understand that the reevaluations will be completed by the end of 2015. Is that correct? That's correct. And then once they're complete, what is NRC's next? What would the next step be for NRC? Uh, depending on what is found, uh, we will have to go uh, individually, plant by plant, and see if, if some changes are required or not. Depends on, on what we find at each plant. Well, thank you. These reevaluations appear to be a critical step in ensuring that the U.S. nuclear fleet is prepared to respond to a range of hazards and protect the public health in an emergency. I appreciate your answers. I don't have any further questions. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Generally, I yield back her time. And now, Chair, I recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Lada, for five minutes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you very much to you all for being here today. We greatly appreciate it. If I could uh, just kind of back up a little bit uh, on uh, what was a few comments made today about cybersecurity. And as we all know, in the last month, month and a half, it's been an issue that's been uh, in the news quite a bit. And, and just in fact, last week in my district, we had uh, a large cybersecurity event that uh, we had the FBI in to, to talk to uh, about 170 plus people in my district as to what's happening, what they have to do to protect themselves and their businesses. But if I could, uh, going back uh, to the, or the NRC had uh, an order after the sep September 11th uh, that had ordered nuclear power plants to enhance their security, including requirements for uh, certain cybersecurity threats. And then this e effort later culminated in a specific cybersecurity rule in 2009, and the associated regulatory guidance was based on the cybersecurity standards published by the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the Department of Homeland Security. And if I could, uh, Commissioner Ostendorf, if I could ask if you could give a, a brief overview of how that rule is being impl implemented in the level of coordination between the NRC and other agencies. Thank you, Congressman, for the question. This is a complicated area. Uh, two years ago, this commission 
worked with FERC and NERC to outline the lines of demarcation using a, what's called a bright line survey to ensure that we had a unitary regulatory approach that only the NRC would regulate inside basically the transmission line boundary of the plants, recognizing that NERC on behalf of FERC is, reg is regulating externally. So that was, uh, I'd say, is a great example of positive cooperation inside the U.S. interagency to ensure we did not have conflicting regulatory inspections, rules, et cetera. The cyber rule that uh, our licensees required to be in compliance with as of the end of December of last year, uh, currently our staffs are out and, and doing inspections to ascertain compliance with that rule. Uh, I think our staff is well equipped to do that. I think we'll find some things we hadn't thought about. This is a tough area. But I think we had the proper resources and the proper approach going forward. This commission is staying very actively involved with our federal agency counterparts. Just last Thursday, we spent two and a half hours in a classified briefing with DHS on cyber issues uh, for the United States. And so I think it's a, an issue that's very much before us as a commission and an agency. Well, thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Magwood, if I could just ask you briefly. I know that uh, about in 2011, when you all were testifying before us here in committee, I'd ask uh, a question, just kind of paraphrasing how, if you had all the information that you needed to make informed decisions, and pretty much you'd said most of the time that that was happening. Could you tell me how, how, how are things going right now with the flow of information back and forth for you all to make these very important decisions that come before the NRC today? Um, actually, uh, Congressman, the question has never come to my mind in the last uh, six or seven months. So I think the, uh, I think the situation at the NRC is working very well. Well, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, chairman Barlin, in your testimony, you mentioned the importance of international cooperation with NRC. In 2011, our committee members, uh, led by Representative Murphy, we did a trip to France and Sweden to see how the French and Swedish reprocess and store their nuclear waste. I was impressed uh, with the progress, not only in France, because I was there in 98, uh, to look at how they're reprocessing their waste, but particularly with Sweden, seeing what they've done with even a um, prototype of a deep storage. Uh, I'm interested in what's uh, learning what cooperation is presently taking place between the Commission and, for example, Sweden and France, on, and what lessons can be taken from their models. In terms of uh, nuclear waste disposal? Nuclear or waste disposal. Uh, we or recycling, because right, that's what... Right. Um, we don't do a lot on the back end of the fuel cycle with these countries. Uh, we certainly exchange information, but with their regulators and what their regulators regulate, uh, because it's not our job to make policy for the back end of the fuel cycle in the U.S. We just oversee the existing facilities. So uh, we're aware of, of what's going on there, and we're aware of what their regulators are, uh, are doing and doing at these facilities. Um, well, it, it sounds like you're saying that uh, for, for the United States to be involved in reprocessing, uh, and even for the long-term nuclear storage, whether it be Yucca Mountain or something similar to what uh, Sweden has done, mm -hmm. uh, you need more guidance from Congress? Yes, please. Okay. Um, myself, along with 25 other Democratic members, sent a letter to you three weeks ago calling for the agency to adopt a flexible performance-based approach as recommended by the independent ACRS with regard to mandating filters on boiling water reactors. First, I want to ask, what's the status of the Commission's response to our letter? We responded to your letter. We okay, sent in did. a response. Unacceptably, but they did respond. <laughs> okay. Second, I'd like to learn what outreach the Commission has made towards industry and other stakeholders in order to achieve the regulatory goal in the safest and more effective and least costly manner. We meet regularly with, uh, with industry and, uh, and other stakeholders who are interested in these issues and uh, understand their concerns and uh, work together. Okay. And another question. In your testimony, you state the NRC, due to the lack of final waste confidence rule, will not issue any final licenses until at least September of 2014. As you're aware, most legislation is passed by this chamber and signed in law typically calls for agencies 
to issue rules within six to 12 months. And I'd like to hear why the commission uh, for an issue that goes to the heart of your agency's duties needs in excess of two years to issue a final rule. We have uh, a lot of, um, in developing an, an environmental impact statement and uh, other processes, we're governed by uh, NEPA law and other uh, laws. And we, there's a public comment period that, that must be incorporated uh, into all these things. And this is in part what, what uh, takes time. Okay. Um, addition, I'd like to learn what guidance the Commission has provided these facilities whose licenses are being delayed. We are actively working on the licenses. We just won't issue the final licenses or license renewals in this period. With the likelihood of sequestration hit near, hitting all federal agencies by midnight tonight, I'd like to ask first, what steps is the NRC taking in order to best comply with sequestration? Are furloughs or layoffs anticipated? We, we do not anticipate any furloughs or layoffs. In second, in sequestration, in any way in degrade the NRC's ability to keep our nation's nuclear facilities safe? Absolutely not. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, and just to, if the gentleman would yield, uh, just to correct the record, I think you were referring to a barrel letter that uh -huh. you signed that I'm unsure of whether the commissioner responded to. Would right. someone want to uh, address? Yeah, we, 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 uh, I believe we have not responded to okay. that. So Sorry. They haven't responded to the, to the barrel letter. Right. Okay, because obviously from South Georgia or, or Georgia, they have a bigger interest in uh, we're having our problems in Texas because one of our investors for the South Texas expansion was uh, also owned Tokyo, uh, Tokyo Power. So um, we're still looking for $125 million to expand nuclear power in South Texas. Thank you. Okay, gentlemen, yields back to time. Chair now recognizes the other gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Uh, Johnson, for five minutes. I thank the uh, chairman for uh, the recognition, and I'm, I'm new to the Energy and Commerce Committee, so... Uh, uh, I, I look forward to the discussions we'll have with uh, with you commissioners, um, and I thank the chairman for holding this hearing on a very very important uh, topic. Um, uh, Ms. McFarland, according to the Japanese government's report, uh, and I quote: "Tepco's manual for emergency response to a severe accident was completely ineffective." Um, what is your view, and the view of your colleagues? Uh, about the ability of U.S. emergency response capability to a severe accident? I think we are prepared, but I think we must be mindful that there are situations that we may not be expecting and we need to learn from operating experience. But I invite my colleagues to comment. One of the, pro I'm sorry. One of the problems that they had in Japan is that there was no single authority making decisions. In this country, we have made sure that there is one authority. We're not going to go to uh, higher political figures to, to approve uh, what needs to be done. So I believe that we are in a much better shape than the Japanese were at that time. Congressman, I just add uh, to my colleagues' comments two specific issues we're also addressing. One, uh, as mentioned earlier, in response to prior question, we have not typically dealt with multiple unit accidents. We've dealt with one reactor accident at one site, even, even if that site had two or three reactors. So we're looking at multi-use, multi-unit response. Secondly, we're looking at how to integrate our casualty and operating procedures in a more effective way. Sure. Well, I, I appreciate those answers, and uh, Mr. Apostolakis, you, uh, you actually hit on something that I want to go to next. Um, the Japanese diet report stated, uh, we believe that the root causes were the organizational and regulatory systems that supported faulty rationales for decisions and actions. A report by the American Nuclear Society Special Committee on Fukushima stated, the committee believes that in responding to the accident at the Fukushima uh, Daiichi plant, Human error and flows in governance and regulatory oversight contributed to the severity of the accident. Uh, Mr. Apostolakis, you just mentioned that we're way ahead of where the Japanese were. Yes. Uh, don't you think it's important to compare our regulatory systems with Japan's to see if we share some of the gaps that contributed to the accident? There is no formal comparison that the Commission has done. 
however, that doesn't mean that we are not aware of the differences. And uh, if one wanted a more formal approach to evaluation, that would be an interesting thing. But I don't think we can say that uh, we completely ignore the differences between us and uh, the Japanese when we issue the uh, actions, the orders or other regulations. Well, I, I, I appreciate that. The, it, it, it seems to me that such a comparison would reveal and further validate what you just testified to, that America is much further ahead of where the Japanese were in terms of information flow, decision making. Uh, and it would seem to me that that would be an important step prior to issuing additional regulations that are going to additionally hamstring our nuclear industry from operating. And in some cases, according to um, uh, nuclear industry experts, uh, drive our team out of existence. So it, it, I'm not sure we're doing our homework. Um, we know that we're ahead of the Japanese, and yet we, we want to proliferate regulations to address what? I mean, if we don't know what the gaps are, what are we addressing? I, I'd like just to comment. I don't think we have, I think we've heard loud and clear today, I don't think we've been effective at communicating back to this committee a satisfactory answer to your question. I think the Japanese uh, le Lessons Learned Directorate about 20 people in our staff have been working on these issues, looking at differences. I think we fail to communicate that in a clear manner to this committee. I think I need to talk to my colleagues about how can we better respond, because I think a lot of the work that we have done, we have not appropriately told you how we're doing it and what we Well, doing. I, I would appreciate responses to that, because I think that's a necessary first step before we start issuing regulations that address some gap that we're not even aware of. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. And I appreciate the gentleman from Ohio. Maybe we'll get a chance to officially ask you for a better response. Um, and now the chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Engel, for five minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and, and, and I welcome everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us here today. Uh, my district is very close to the Indian Point nuclear plant in Buchanan, New York. Um, the safety of Indian Point continues to be one of the most serious issues facing the Hudson Valley region, and I've been calling for it to be shut down for years. I was the first member of Congress to call for it shut down probably about 10 years ago, and Governor Cuomo has also called for it to shut down. The bottom line is the siting of the plant. Uh, it is in, near the major metropolitan area in the country, the New York uh, metropolitan area, and if it were being built today, it would never be built uh, in Buchanan, New York. Um, frankly, uh, I think that the scrutiny of uh, renewal, uh, the renewal for the licenses of these plants, uh, should be as great as uh, a new plant being built. I don't understand why there seems to be a less of a threshold uh, for reauthorization of the plants, relicensing of the plants, uh, than there is for a brand new plant. Safety is safety, and it should be the same uh, for both of that. Um, since the disaster at Fukushima, the need to shut down Indian plant, as far as I'm concerned, has only grown. I'm not opposed to nuclear power. I never mentioned uh, closing Indian points until I started learning about it. Um, it's built on a major fault. Uh, on September 11th, one of the planes hitting the World Trade Center flew directly uh, over Indian Point. Um, it's just uh, unbelievable. I'm, I'm happy that the NRC has implemented three immediate orders, but I hope there will be strong follow-up, especially in regards to plants like Indian Point that have a history of problems. The fire last year at one of the transformers is just the latest in a long line of systematic failures at the point. Let me say every member of Congress who has a district very near to the, to the um, Indian Point has called for its closing. Um, beyond the safety issues at Indian Point, there are numerous environmental concerns, effects on the Hudson River, um, and I've asked the NRC to, to, to see if we can move to a closed cycle cooling system, which would have less of an impact on the water uh, and the fish. Another major concern is the radioactive waste stored in the pools. Almost three times the amount is currently being stored there than was stored at Fukushima. And the plant sits uh, near a res reservoir that serves almost 9 million people. Um, I, I hope uh, we will uh, find a long-term plan for storing this w waste. Um, I'll soon be reintroducing legislation that would call for material to be moved into dry casks within a year, and I hope that we will, we will consider it. 
Uh, let me say that the safety violations at Indian Point and other nuclear power plants have raised serious questions about nuclear power safety. I anticipate that the NRC will continue to monitor the plans closely and to see if the three immediate orders are implemented uh, quickly and effectively. Could, can someone uh, please tell me why there seems to be a lesser standard uh, for the, the relicensing of plans than there, would, than there is to build a plant? Um, if a plant is unsafe or if there are questions about its safety, uh, why should it matter uh, if it is newly built or if it is a renewed, uh, have a plant, an old plant with a license is being renewed. Uh, safety is safety, and that's the bottom line. I'm wondering if anybody can tell me the rationale for that. I'll take a, a stab at that and offer it to my colleagues. But uh, very, very briefly, um, in relicensing, we look at the overall systems and structures in the plant. We continually evaluate the equipment uh, and inspect and oversee the equipment, the operations of the facility, the safety culture of the facility. We have resident inspectors on site. Currently, right now at Indian Point, there are four for two reactors who every day are there overseeing the safe operation of the facility. But let me ask my colleagues to jump in. Yeah, I don't think it's accurate to say that uh, we have a lesser standard for license renewal. The license renewal focuses on aging effects, and I think that's appropriate because the plant has operated for 40 years or, or will have been operated for 40 years. If anything else happens that threatens safety, as the chairman said, then it is handled according to the normal processes we have for operating plants. So the only new thing is this aging effect. So it's not a lesser standard. It's a more limited review. The scope is more limited. Well, it, it, it still would seem to me, I understand what you're saying, and it, but it still would seem to me that uh, the scope should be, should be broadened. There, there, have been, there have been questions uh, about it, and uh, they're legitimate questions. It's not just two or three people who are opposed to nuclear power. There are serious questions by those of us that support nuclear power, um, and I do. I think the United States has to have a balanced uh, energy uh, policy, but um, I, I think that um, it's clear to me that Indian Point should be shut down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Mules, back his time. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hall, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I noted uh, Chairman uh, Magwood, uh, uh, you're talking of issues and the things that you're faced with. And and I, I just thinking of uh, that you. I don't know what the hell's wrong with this thing? <laughs> Old people get treated like that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, you're not doing that, are you? <laughs> all right, I'll go out and come in again. Uh, I'm just trying to make the point that you all do works and studies for us. Uh, and with dangerous and threatening and relentless uh, enemies out there. The, uh, I think I want to ask uh, Commissioner Apostolakis, I do better calling you George. Did I pronounce it right? Yes, George was close right. enough. Uh, a year ago, you testified before the Senate APW committee and made the following remarks, quote, I don't think that what happened in Fukushima can happen here, and I repeat it, it was not unthinkable. Were you talking about it was not unthinkable that that could happen there? Is that what you meant? It's not important, no, no, but that's people, the way I took it. People were saying that uh, what happened in Fukushima was an unthinkable event. Yeah. And I said, no, it was not. It okay. was not. I mean, there were so many flaws in the system and the design okay. that really was not unthinkable. Yeah. Well, let me go. I'm, in fairness to you, say what you did say. You said, I don't think what happened in Fukushima can happen here. And I repeat, it was not unthinkable. They made terrible mistakes. They are, I think, a couple of things that stand out. If you look at what happened in Japan, the regulatory authority there, NISA, was very, very weak technically, and they didn't have the amount of independence that we have, for example. The second is more technical. It has to do with the Tsumi uh, calculations, where they, they were very poorly done, let's put it that way. They ignored data from the past. 
Is that still, do you feel still that? This is still my view, yes. Uh, that you don't think that an accident like Fukushima can happen here? No, I don't think so. Well, well, I mean, could. I hope so. I hope you're right. But, you know, some 15 or 20 years ago, we did a study uh, in the committee I chaired at that time studying uh, asteroids, and we found out during the hearing, and I got people from Russia, China, uh, England, and I believe France, they were supposed to have witnesses here. None of them showed because they were told that we were going to try to get a world operation to look for asteroids and because they affect the world, not just Texas or not just your state or this nation. And none of them showed. But during the committee hearing, it came up that an asteroid had just missed this country by 15 minutes, just sometime the year before. No one knew it. I didn't know it. No one knew it. And we really ought to be studying that. Uh, do you, uh, I think, isn't it more reasonable to think and to thoroughly consider the, the imposition of additional requirements and ensure that any requirements are cost effective, that, that an accident like Fukushima can happen here? The, the asteroid just happened in Russia, and we've got copies of it, pictures of it. We know what happened there. Don't know when it why it was there, when it was coming, and when the next one will come. So you, you protect us from very serious and relentless enemies. Uh, why isn't it that you think that that just couldn't happen? Please don't let up because it could happen. Well, I don't think the, the, the question really should be whether something can happen or cannot happen. It's really a, a question of probability. And for example, you mentioned the asteroid issue. I don't think that it, would, that it would be rational on our part to start protecting nuclear plants from asteroids. It happened in Russia, but you know this is not something that should be included. In I apologize. I have no idea what's going on it's with okay. the microphone. Okay, I took my phone out. We'll phone. work. We'll work through it. But uh, yes. would the gentleman continue? Yeah. Uh, don't you kind of think the public might benefit from a better understanding of the differences between nuclear safety in Japan and nuclear safety here? No, we certainly would benefit from that, yes. But if you think it couldn't happen here, uh, I, I don't understand how you could answer that last question as you did. And, but I know things can happen. I, I, I don't know how much more time I have. Your, your time's expired. Uh, I, in that case, I want to yield a question or the gentleman's gone. No, the gentleman's time's expired. I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back time. Chair now recognizes. <clears throat> chair now recognizes. Just in time for Mr. Markey. So uh, uh, chair now recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. The Fukushima meltdowns taught us that not only do we need to develop safeguards to prevent nuclear accidents, but we must also plan strategies to respond to such an accident and to minimize the damage. Twenty-three reactors in this country have the same design as the ones that melted down in Japan, including Pilgrim in Massachusetts and Vermont Yankee. The NRC staff recommended that these reactors have vents that could release hydrogen gas to prevent the sort of explosions that occurred in Japan, and also that the vents include filters to remove the radioactive materials uh, that would be released into the air if the vents were used. These filtered vents are already used in Canada and in many European countries. I strongly urge the Commission to follow the recommendations of the technical staff. Uh, if you fail to do so, uh, I believe you will be making a mistake. Uh, I think you have a responsibility to ensure public health and safety in the face of a nuclear catastrophe that we know could happen here. You have all testified in the past that you support the Commission's internal Commission procedures. Uh, do you all believe that we should, that we should uh, follow those internal Commission procedures that are currently in force? Do you all believe that that is the case? Yes. We should, I think we should strive to comply with our internal commission procedures, but they don't foresee every situation that might occur. Ah. So I have here a, a copy of your procedures for transmitting sensitive documents 
to Congress, which says that your general practice is to release them to members of your oversight committee, and that includes every member of this committee. Over the years, members of this committee have requested and received hundreds of sensitive documents as part of their oversight efforts, including security-sensitive materials, proprietary materials, and other non-public documents. I believe that every member of this committee will be as disturbed as I was to learn that in its failure to fully respond to several of my most recent oversight letters, the Commission is currently violating its internal Commission procedures. The Commission is even considering a change to these procedures to enable it to refuse future requests for documents made by members of this committee. So I ask all of you, do you support your current procedures to provide sensitive documents to members of your oversight committee? I, right now, the Commission is evaluating the request that you made, and uh, we're in deliberations on it, and I don't want to say any more about that until we've actually been able to go through that. Well, uh, I think that, um, in fact, the Justice Department um, has made a, a ruling that, uh, although there might be a conflict with the Freedom of Information Act, that, in fact, their current guidance says that giving materials to a member of Congress should not result in an agency having uh, to uh, make them public. So if you make this change, you will be obstructing legitimate congressional oversight of your activities, and you will be creating a more secretive agency. Uh, and I am going to resist this uh, in every single way I can. Uh, the San Onofre nuclear reactors have been shut down for more than a year because of unexpectedly high levels of wear found in both steam generators. Three weeks ago, Senator Boxer and I sent you a document I obtained that said that Southern California Edison and Mitsubishi engineers had identified some technical problems that could have caused this wear long before the steam generators were installed. But the document also said that they chose not to implement uh, recommended design fixes because they wanted to avoid a more rigorous safety review and licensing process at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. You then told us that you had initiated an expansive investigation regarding the completeness and accuracy of information that had been provided to you. And I understand that the Inspector General has also initiated an investigation of its own. So, Chairman, uh, 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 Chairperson uh, McFarland, um, Southern California Edison wants to restart one of the reactors as soon as this summer. Can you commit to postponing any decision on this request until after the pending investigations are completed and reviewed by the Commission? What our usual process is in this kind of situation, when all the technical aspects of the particular issues have been adequately addressed, uh, our staff, our Executive Director of Operations, will check with the our Office of Inspector General, our Office of Investigations, to ask if there are any issues or information that might prevent the restart. And that's how we usually go about things. Well, I strongly recommend that you complete the investigation before you give permission to restart. I think that's the um, prudent uh, way to proceed uh, on this issue. And uh, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time's expired. Just for um, uh, informing the public, there are votes now on the floor. We're going to try to make sure our those in attendance get a chance to speak. I would encourage people to do it uh, quickly. I would also, just in response to my colleague, is uh, I think there's an understanding of personnel and executive sessions and issues in the record that, that may not be appropriate to air, um, and so we can address that later. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, the gentleman from, West, from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I do appreciate all of you all being here. I, I will tell you that uh, in my first term of Congress, that first meeting that I had with you all, not you, uh, Chairman, but uh, before you were on board, was probably the scariest uh, hearing that I participated in just because I knew the important issues you all were dealing with and, and the problems that you all were having were uh, of great concern. I feel much better today. While we may, may or may not agree on some issues, uh, I feel uh, very confident that you all are working hard and trying to move in the right direction, and it makes me feel much better than I did uh, this time a little short of two years ago. So I do appreciate that. I would uh, uh, ask uh, you all to, to look at, and particularly I'm going to uh, direct this question to you, Commissioner uh, Ostendorf. Um, 
you all have had some time uh, working on this and the subcommittees have. And in, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, we had a nuclear power plant, North Anna, which after experiencing a nearby earthquake in Mineral, Virginia, was shut down for a period of time. We understand this shutdown was a result of the earthquake and subsequent NRC processes were a positive example of bringing a unit back online after an atypical event. The uh, San uh, Onofre nuclear generating station, which was just mentioned, is currently offline. And I, I know there may be other issues involved, but uh, it had an atypical event that initially, at least, didn't rank as high as the, uh, as the earthquake. And I'm just wondering if you can explain if the process that was used at North Anna is also the same process that's currently being used in that situation, with San, San Onofre. Congressman, I would comment that uh, overall the process uh, is the same as far as how a determination is made whether it is safe to technically restart a nuclear power plant. There are some significant differences, however, between the San Onofre case and the North Anna earthquake from August of 2011. Uh, those differences uh, involve other pending investigations, which we can't discuss in this forum. They also involve adjudication matters before our Atomic Safety and Licensing Board. So I'll acknowledge that there are some significant differences there. All right. I appreciate that. I had another question. I'm going to just make a statement. It appears that when looking at regulations, and, and I've been given some data, that uh, it, it appears that the estimates for new regulations, the cost of those estimates have been off by being as much as 350 percent more. I hope that you all will look at your processes behind the scenes because when you're deciding what to do on a regulation, there is a cost analysis involved. And um, if you're off by 350 percent, it indicates that something's not being analyzed correctly. And I would hope that you all would do a better job on that as you go forward with any new regulations. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to yield back. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, I recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Barrow, for five minutes. I thank the chairman. I thank the commissioners for appearing today. I just want to share my concerns about proposed regulations to require the installation of external containment filters on uh, boiling water reactors. I want, to, I, I want to begin by saying I understand the commission requires a cost-benefit analysis in order to make sure there's adequate protection for the public. I also understand that there is a movement to go forward with such regulations, even in the absence of a finding that it's necessary in order to provide adequate protection for, for the public concern. I have generated a letter which has been subscribed to by a number of my colleagues, members of the House as diverse as um, uh, Mike McIntyre, Jim Matheson, myself, Mr. Dingle on the one hand, and other members like Steny Hoyer, Jim Clyburn, Mike Doyle, uh, Joe Crowley, Rob Andrews, and Shaka Fatah on the other, basically m making the case that we want to have you all make sure that there's an adequate cost-benefit analysis performed before imposing any such mandate on the industry. The letter concludes as follows, absent a finding that mandatory filter installation is necessary to ensure adequate protection of the public. We believe the Commission should work with the industry to achieve the regulatory goal in the safest, most effective, and least costly manner. That letter speaks for itself, and with the Chairman's permission, I'd like to make sure to submit this letter for inclusion in the record. Uh, without objection, so the, we've already discussed the letter a no, little no, bit. Yep. In the I, I, wanna, I, wanna make, I wanna make it a part of the record on, <laughs> on my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all. Uh, General Mules, back to time. Chair, now recognize our final member, uh, Mr. Kinsinger from Illinois, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for your time today. Uh, Chairman McFarland, I'm happy to see that the focus of this hearing is on the important work of the Commission. I believe your work over the next several years will determine the viability of the industry, and your decisions will have an impact on U.S. energy policy for decades. The members of this committee need to be aware that the bounty of natural gas that we've unlocked through technology and innovation is a blessing, but it's going to bring new challenges. I have 35 power generated facilities in my district and every single one is being impacted by the lower price of natural gas, including the four nuclear power plants. Good for the consumer, but it may not be good for a diverse energy supply. We have some of the best minds in the world creating and collaborating on new nuclear technology. It'd be a shame if low cost natural gas discouraged U.S. companies from investing in nuclear R&D facilities and education. A lot of what you've heard today is about the regulatory process and I believe that the members who support nuclear power want to ensure that the Commission is operating under the best processes for the safety of the plant. I hope you'll help us in this effort by answering a few more questions. We'll just make them quick yes or no questions. I understand that the Atomic Energy Act grants the Commission broad authority to issue safety requirements and that the Commission's regulatory tools include orders, rulemaking, and policy statements. So just yes or no, please. With regard to orders, is it true that the Commission has the authority to issue orders with merely a majority vote? We'll start with you. Yes. 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 
Is it true that the commission has the authority to issue orders without conducting technical and cost benefit analysis? Mm -hmm. If we deem it adequate protection, yes. So yes. 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 A regulatory basis is required for orders. Okay. Is it true that the commission has the authority to issue orders without any public participation? Uh, do you have the authority? Yes, we okay. do. Yes. And as I understand it, safety requirements that the commission uh, determines are necessary for the adequate protection of safety are not subjected to cost benefit analysis. The less significant safety enhancements are subject to cost benefit analysis and, if found inadequate, can be challenged under the agency's backfit rule. Is it true that orders are not subject to challenge under the backfit rule? True. Yes. Okay. Yet we have we yet here we have the agency staff recommending that you issue an order to mandate filter systems, an approach that your expert advisory body, the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards, disagrees with, that fail to cost benefit analysis, and about which there are serious questions that agency staff may have to underestimate the cost, may have underestimated the cost. I believe that orders are a necessary and a valid tool where there's an urgent safety need in the immediate aftermath of events like September eleventh or Fukushima. However, it is nearly two years since the Fukushima accident and the Commission acted on the most urgent safety significant changes a year ago. It's time to return to what we members would call regular order, restoring the agency's historic reliance on rigorous technical and cost benefit analysis and public involvement inherent in the process of rulemaking. I understand my friend and colleague Lee Terry is working on legislation in this area and I plan to work with him to address my concern that the Commission's use of orders should be limited to urgent significant safety needs. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Gentlemen, yield back his time. We want to thank you for coming. It will not be your last appearance. Uh, I know you're looking forward to that. If there are no other members wishing to ask questions, members are reminded the record will remain open for 10 business dates to submit additional questions for the record. There being no other business to come before the subcommittee, the, the subcommittee stands adjourned.